So when we start getting into the applications of quantum computing, there are several things uh, that we can, of course, uh, several ways essentially that we can approach it, one of them being kind of looking from the perspective of quantum cryptography. And the reason this is actually one of my personal favorites is largely because it gives you an idea of how to apply, you know, the mathematics that you learned, the linear algebra and the uh, mathematical model of qubits um, that we've briefly covered in the past. And so quantum cryptography and cryptography in general is this general idea that you want to send a message uh, between two people. Let's say Alice here wants to send a message to Bob, right? Alice to Bob. And Alice uh, wants to send it in such a way such that an eavesdropper, right? Like someone named Eve, some neighbor of hers, won't be able to get in and essentially look at the message and go like, Hey, I know what you're having for dinner tonight. I decoded your message. That is the last thing Alice here wants. And so naturally, um, she's going to be using some sort of encryption protocol and Bob's going to be using some sort of encryption key in order to decode the message that Alice has sent. Now, when we put it in terms of classical and quantum computers, um, there are naturally a few uh, difficulties and you know, differences regarding, you know, notation and uh, how we call uh, the messages that they're, you know, sending across. First things first being that classical computers label the information they're sending in terms of zero and one. And this can be easily solved in the following way. So Alice, let's say she's using a uh, uh, some sort of apparatus to measure uh, the qubits, the spin of her qubits. And so what she does is she goes like, okay, so we got our little qubit Q and we're measuring in some degree theta, right? We're going to call this direction degree theta. Generally, it's referred to as north, but we're going to refer to here as zero, and we're going to call south referred to it as one. Simple, right? So when you have classical computers, we have zeros and ones, and in quantum computers, we're going to call north, the northward direction of whatever spin direction you're measuring in as zero, and you know the southward direction as one. And same goes for Bob. And so with that in mind, Quite clearly, when we're using classical computers, Alice and Bob have to measure their qubits, right? Their information storage kind of little items um, in using some sort of degree and some sort of orthonormal basis. And so Alice is going to be measuring her qubits in directions uh, A1 and A0. And Bob, on the other hand, is going to be measuring his in directions B0 and B1. And I apologize for the mixing up of, you know, the... the ordered in this case this ordered pair so when alice sends her qubits she's going to be sending say if she wants to send some message we'll call this zero let's call this vector here uh one zero one right we're going to have uh it represented as let's say she wants to send a zero actually across the bomb so she's going to send the vector a one she's going to measure her qubits and she's going to send the ones that measure in direction zero over to bob and bob's going to be using his own apparatus to essentially measure it and so what occurs is that when he attempts to measure the set of particles that alice has and over. Uh, several things happen. One, we know that it can be represented as a linear combination of Bob's orthonormal uh, bases and as a linear combination of the vectors that he has in this particular basis, right? D0, uh, B0, and D1, B1, right? It's just a linear combination. What we know, of course, from previous experience, and perhaps, you know, this might be your first time seeing this, but essentially D0 and D1 here are our probability amplitudes, and we know that the probability of getting uh, B0 in this case is going to be D0 squared, and the probability of getting uh, B1 here in a little bit ah, short on space is going to be D1 squared straightforward. All right, so now going back to the idea of someone eavesdropping, right? When you have a neighbor, some nosy kind of individual, maybe someone at your workplace, your colleague, anyone who wants to get in and kind of hear this message, kind of listen in on it. Let's say that's Eve right over here, right? And what Eve is going to do is she's going to say, all right, how can I break in? How can I essentially decode this message? And in general, you know, it's, it's pretty difficult uh, for the most part. If you're using a classic computer, it can take thousands of years to essentially even just decode a given a message and even just obtain essentially the encryption key. Of course, with quantum computers, uh, precisely how long that takes is slightly different given that quantum computers do operate using slightly different principles um, on several and for several reasons. Now, the thing here is that with Eve, right, she wants to listen in. And so with the presence of some public outsider, some general individual out there, there are several observations that be, may be made. Um, first one being, you know, the question of how simple can we make this for Alice and Bob? And the answer uh, is not entirely straightforward. So if you want to talk about the easiest possible set of bases that Alice and Bob can use, right? Alice and Bob, right? We can just say, hey, why don't we have Alice and Bob both use the same orthonormal bases? Why don't we have them measure their qubits in the same exact direction? 
right? So if they are measured in the same exact direction, then any qubit um, that is measured, say, in direction 0 will be sent over to Bob, and he will measure it in direction 0. Any qubit that's measured in direction 1 will be sent to Bob, and he will measure it in direction uh, 1 as well, because we know with absolute certainty that if we are using the same exact vectors, in this case, right, say a 0, this will become uh, equal to 1 times, oops, notational issue. There we go. Uh, B0 plus 0 B1, right? Because in this case, we know that Alice and Bob are essentially using the same exact uh, set of bases. So B0 corresponds to A0 and B1 corresponds to A1. That's basically like saying when you send a particle of some sort and you measure its spin in some direction, so you measure in direction north, you measure in direction zero in this case, then then you send it in a direction uh, through another apparatus that is again measuring its spin in the same exact direction, you will get the same exact answer, right? Ask someone the same question again and again with nothing in between and you will receive the same exact answer. And so we know with absolute certainty. And so you might say, all right, that's great, you know, you have a 0% chance of having someone misinterpret the message you're attempting to send. That's great, but you forgot about Eve, right? Our nosy little neighbor here. And so our nosy neighbor here, you know, however you know, cringy it might be, right? Our nosy neighbor Eve right over here, if she ever so much even happens to guess the direction you're measuring your orthonormal bases, uh, your qubits and she so happens just be using that set of orthonormal vectors, then all of a sudden Eve is receiving the same exact messages as Bob and she has the same exact method of decoding what we have and the message that Alice wants to send to Bob and that becomes an issue. And so in this case, we're going to ask that Alice and Bob quite sadly have to choose different orthonormal uh, bases uh, in measuring the direction for their qubits. Now, going on from there, let's kind of approach this with a specific example of some sort. And there are several ways to kind of do this. Uh, you might say, for instance, that Alice and Bob have to choose between, you know, two orthonormal bases, uh, measuring in the zero degree direction and measuring in the, say, 90 degree direction, right? Um, and in that case, basically, what we'll be looking at is something along the lines of, like, 1, 0, right? We'll call this our qubit 0, um, and then... Uh, zero, 01, right? This is our zero degree direction orthonormal bases, and our 90 degree orth uh, direction, I'm sorry, uh, orthonormal bases would look something along the lines of 1 over root 2, oops, 1 over root 2, and then negative 1 over root 2, and then in this case, 1 over root 2, and again, positive 1 over root 2, right? So this is 90 degrees. This is zero degrees, qubits zero and one, qubits zero and one. And so what we know is, let's say Alice is using uh, some sort of orthonormal basis as measuring the zero degree direction. She sends to Bob a zero, and so she sends a vector in the form uh, of zero, one. And we know this can be represented as linear combination, I'm sorry, yes, a linear combination uh, of uh, something along the lines of like one over root two, um, with 1 over root 2, negative 1 over root 2, plus 1 over root 2. Right, and this is, I do believe I might be ignoring the signs here. Um, so we'll just do it like that. But in general, uh, all signs aside, might be positive, might be negative, uh, we know that the probability of Bob, you know, measuring the qubit that Alice has sent over in the 0, uh, in the north, right, it, it, with the value 0 is equal to 1 over root 2 squared, which is a probability uh, of 1 half. And again, the probability of measuring it in uh, a qubit of value 1 is, again, equal to 1 half. So what that's saying here is because Alice here has sent a qubit of value 0, we know that there's a 1 half uh, instance, right? 1 half of the time, Bob will be measuring the correct information from this qubit that Alice has sent over. 1 half of the time, he will be uh, essentially reading the wrong information from this qubit. He will be reading uh, like the wrong letter, the wrong message, uh, anything along those lines, right? And so you might be saying, all right, a 1 half chance, that doesn't seem very useful because half the time you're right, half the time you're wrong. You know what's so great about that? And of course, we'll illustrate that in a moment. It is entirely possible uh, to actually capitalize upon this probability and this concept of probability. Um, and we can partially illustrate uh, something similar with a slightly different instance and slightly different set of orthonormal bases. And so in the future, let's say we have, and let's say Alice and Bob have the ability to choose between three directions, uh, let's say zero degrees, right? Zero degrees, uh, 120 degrees and uh, 240 degrees. 
And so let's say Alice goes first and Alice is like, hey, I'm going to be measuring my qubits in the direction of 240 degrees. And let me briefly label that, right? Alice is going to be measuring her qubits in the direction 240. Alice. And Bob is going to be measuring his qubits in the direction 120 degrees. And we know from just previous experience and maybe perhaps from like some experimental, some geometrical analysis, that if we want to talk about the orthonormal bases in some given spin direction, then we know that its spin can be uh, the orthonormal basis that represents its spin can be given and written in the form of cosine theta over 2, right, and negative sine theta over 2 for your first vector theta over 2. And keep in mind, theta in this case would be your 120 degrees or your 240 degrees or even your 0 degrees, and then negative sine uh, theta over 2, right, Boop. and then we have here, uh, I do believe, sine theta over 2 and cosine theta over 2. And so that gives us our orthonormal uh, basis. So if Alice is measuring in a 240 degree dire direction, um, then in this case, uh, the essentially the orthonormal basis that she'll be using, right, Alice, and we'll label uh, her orthonormal basis down here, give it, uh, Alice's orthonormal basis right here would uh, be given as cosine of 240 over 2, which is cosine of 120 degrees. Um, and cosine of 120 degrees should be, I do believe, negative 1 half, and then sine, a negative sine of uh, 120 degrees would be negative, I think, root over 3 over 2, right? And its corresponding uh, partner in this case would be sine of 120 degrees, which is 1 half, and then cosine of uh, 120 degrees, which is negative root 3. Oh, I apologize. Hang on, I got this backwards. My mathematical trigonometry uh, kind of related brain is a little bit on the sour side right now. So root 3 over 2 and then uh, negative 1 over 2. All right, so this is the orthonormal basis that Alice is measuring in uh, from a fundamental perspective. And so Bob, on the other hand, Bob is measuring it in the direction 120 degrees. So we're looking at something like the cosine uh, of uh, 60 degrees, right? Because that's 120 divided by 2. And so cosine here would be, all right, let me make sure this looks a little bit slightly neater. All right, so cosine of 60 degrees uh, would merely be 1 half. And then we have, in this case, negative uh, root 3 over 2. Right, so negative root 3 over 2. Right, and our second kind of partner vector, uh, I'm sorry, yeah, vector in this case would be positive root 3 over 2 and positive 1 half. All right, and so th these are essentially the uh, orthonormal bases that Alice and Bob are measuring in. This is uh, kind of applying what we had previously. Now, actually, if uh, you do want to make things a little bit easier on yourself, keep in mind that if you multiply this entire orthonormal basis by negative 1, uh, it's essentially still the same basis. So we're going to make this positive 1, positive root over uh, root 3 over 2, and then negative root 3 over 2, and positive 1 over half. Uh, this is essentially measuring spin in the direction 60 degrees, um, which is, you know, if you think about it, essentially the same thing as measuring spin in the 240 degrees uh, minus, you know, signs in general, which should be, in this case, uh, arbitrary. So let's say Alice wants to send a message, right? And so we have our orthonormal bases. We know uh, how we're going to describe this message in a sense. Right? And so when we send this message, let's say Alice wants to send it uh, a message of 0. So this is 0, this is 1, this is 0, this is 1. Alice wants to send a qubit of value 0. And so she's going to send a qubit that has its spin measured and that can be represented as 1 over 2 and root 3 uh, over 2. Right? And we're going to represent this as an orthonormal basis uh, in Bob's, uh, as a linear combination of Bob's orthonormal uh, vectors. Um, 1 over 2, root 3 over 2. I'm sorry, negative root 3 over 2 plus something, right? That's your probability amplitude, and then root 3 over 2 and 1 half, or 1 over 2, right? And so in order to calculate this, we can just apply what we know before. We can take the a matrix composed of the bras of uh, Bob's uh, orthonormal basis, so 1 over 2, and then negative root 3 over 2, right? And then we have root 3 over 2 and then 1 half. Right, I'm going to multiply it by the 
essentially the vector that we're attempting to translate. Um, and so in this case, that would be 1 over 2 and root 3 over 2. And this is going to give us the values of d0 and d1. So keep in mind, d0 is your probability uh, amplitude of 4, your first vector, um, and d1 is your probability amplitude for your second vector in your linear combination. And the resultant should look uh, just using, you know, straightforward uh, matrix operations and matrix multiplication. In this case, we should uh, essentially result in a negative 1 half. Right, negative 1 over 2, and I do believe root 3 over 2. All right, and so from there, we know that d0 here is going to be negative 1 over 2. And this here is root 3 over 2, right? just using what we know from before. And so we now have the probability amplitudes. And so when Alice sends a qubit of value 0, so Alice is going to be sending a qubit of value 0. Right? And let me make sure we are very clear on precisely what that is. So Alice's message is going to be sending a zero. And so what Bob receives, what Bob receives is that he's going to receive a zero, uh, approximately negative one half. Oops, let me use a parentheses here. He's going to be measuring it as a zero uh, one fourth of the time. And for the remaining three fourths of the time, right, that's root three over two squared, which is going to be three over four, right, three fourths of the time he's going to be measuring a qubit um, with direction one. Um, so, which means that one fourth of the time Bob is going to be correct. He's going to be measuring and he's going to get zero with probability one fourth and uh, one with probability three over four, which is the incorrect answer for the latter. Right, and so this can essentially be checked in. So if Alice sends one, on the other hand, he'll be getting probability one uh, with probability uh, one over four for this qubit, and be measuring zero with probability three over four. Um, and so this is actually quite a curious and kind of interesting way to kind of look at the way that Bob and Alice are kind of transmitting this uh, message. And so, essentially, to put it simply, when Alice sends a message, in this case, he's going to be Bob is going to be getting this message correct one fourth of the time. All right, so that's kind of a look at how quantum cryptography kind of relates to the mathematical models that we've established previously. Um, and essentially the idea of having encryption keys and you know going between and translating between these orthonormal bases and directions of measurement right, for quantum cryptography. And this kind of lays the foundation uh, for future calculations regarding algorithms and regarding uh, how to determine and encrypt and decrypt a uh, given message of some sort. Again, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate uh, to visit uh, Community Quantum tech website. Um, and as always, stay curious and keep on learning. Thank you.